You're watching Adjuster TV. So I had some questions here from a gentleman in the Adjuster TV private Facebook group. Um, he says, I do have some questions as my wife and I are considering becoming IAs at some point, and we wanted to make sure we have adequately prepared ourselves, researched everything we might need, and gotten all of our important questions answered since we are both new to this. So first question is, are we able to work together on claims that we adjust? Do adjusters typically do this? And do firms allow this sort of thing? Um, he says, for example, one person focused on roofs, the other on elevations, um, thinking it could save some money uh, for lodging and equipment and all that kind of stuff. Yes. <clears throat> but the short answer to that question is, is that in my experience as an adjuster who has worked with, as a team and who have seen other people work as teams, I think that the very best way to do it is to, um, to outsource your desk, right? So in other words, I've, I've seen adjusters who will, uh, one person sitting in the car and they've got the laptop and they're on the radio or like whatever with the person who's scoping the house. And so they, the person who's scoping the house will call back the measurements and everything. And then when they come back to the, to the truck, there's a completed estimate. They hand off their SD card and then they go up and settle up with the insured. That works pretty well. Um, I think that the, the couple, the married couple that I saw that I think was doing it the best, both had their own individual claims. So they were individual licensed adjusters. When the IA firm called them, the, they said, hey, um, Mr. Childs, I need you to go to Omaha, Nebraska for hailstorm, right? And then they would call Mrs. Childs and say, hey, Mrs. Childs, I need you to go to Omaha, Nebraska for a hailstorm, right? And they know that you're, they're going to know that you're a team because you're going to tell them. You guys go together, you go off and do your claims, she goes off and does her claims, and then you hire an assistant who will look after your desk, uh, help make contact calls, do callbacks, work on your schedule, you know, make sure the exact, exact analysis is up to date, all your notes and everything. It takes some experience to get to that point um, to where you can outsource that kind of thing because you've got to be able to know how to train somebody on how to do all those things. So my best advice to you would be to one person who's going to be like the face of the, the claims, right? The person who's kind of taking the lead on the whole thing. You run claims, you do you do everything right, and maybe the, your your assistant is there to um, help answer the phone or whatever, or kind of help a little bit with that light sort of phone work on when you do your first deployments, um, because you want to you want to be it's just like with anything else you want to know how to do everything before you you start outsourcing things to other people right. There's a lot of different ways to do it, and a lot of a lot of adjusters and anybody can chime in here, um, and kind of contribute who's done this before, but there's a lot of different ways to do this. Um, but I think from what I've seen that having, if you're a married couple, everybody just go do their own claims and then have one person pay one person day rate or an hourly rate, something like that to look after your uh, phone work and do exact analysis stuff and your notes and your scheduling. Cause you're going to get new claims. You're going to get corrections and things like that. And you're going to need somebody to kind of be there to, to like, if it's just you by yourself doing those things, you have to kind of have to stop what you're doing or make the schedule time during your day to, to look after corrections, voicemail, and things like that. Otherwise, they'll get lost in the mix. And you can't call people back at 11 o'clock at night, right? So if, you, if, you, if you're like, I'm going to scope all day and I'm going to write estimates all night, and by the time you get to like answering voicemails, it's midnight, you can't, I mean, you can try to call, but nobody's going to answer the phone. And if they do, they won't be happy. So great question. Question number two. Do you recommend getting specific vaccinations before working claims in disaster areas? I, the only thing I'll tell you is just make sure you got an up-to-date tetanus shot, and that goes for working anywhere, because you could step on a rusty nail in anybody's backyard, anywhere in the country, at any time, and then that's nobody wants lockjaw. You don't have to get. Uh, it, we don't. It's, generally speaking, you're not seeing typhus or cholera, or you know other communicable diseases like their malaria. It's not really something that we have in the U.S. Um, if that if the situation is bad enough to where you have like a cholera outbreak, nobody's going in, right? They're going to evacuate everybody or quarantine people, and they're not going to let anybody in to run claims. I've never, I have never heard of it. In my 20 years, I've never heard of anybody getting vaccinated. Just make sure that your regular vaccinations are up to date, primarily your, uh, your, uh, 
tetanus shot. And these days, once they're once if you know, depending on how old you are, you know, make sure that you get a COVID vaccination and you've got a you know, you get a little a receipt or whatever so that you can so if, if an insured gives you grief about it, you can be like, Well, yeah, I'm already vaccinated, right? And show them your receipt. Um, or a passport if they're gonna do that thing. So who knows? Um, question number three. <clears throat> We have looked up recommended tools and equipment and that we would need for adjusters. Are there any specific tools that you would recommend adjusters to use? Do you have a list of recommended or required items that we would need to purchase as we begin? I mean, in this case, if you, you, most people are gonna get started as catastrophe property adjusters or as daily auto appraisers. Um, so if I'm a property guy, so I'm gonna tell you the property stuff. Anybody who's do, who does uh, auto, can jump in and kind of give the, I don't, you don't need a whole lot of stuff. You primarily are going to need, I would say to get a, uh, if you've got a pickup truck or an SUV with a, a luggage rack on top to get an, an 18 foot plus to maybe 20, 22 foot extension ladder. Uh, I find them to be lighter and a little bit easier to, de to deploy. Only drawback with them, of course, is you can't really take them inside of somebody's house. If you needed to access an, an attic or like a, sometimes people have a little like, you get in their linen closet in their hallway. They don't have the pull down thing with the stairs on it. And there's a little, you have to climb up inside their linen closet in order to get up into the, uh, the attic to take, take a look around, see if there's any damage up there or if they have space decking or whatever. Um, so if you just have a car and you got a trunk, you know, you can buy a folding ladder that's, you know, 20 foot. I wouldn't go any, any, any shorter than 18 foot. 16 foot ladder sounds like it's going to be a good, length for you but you have to remember that um you know if you, it's it's, it's uh, anything that's more than don't get a 12 foot ladder let's put it this way most people's eve heights are about eight or nine feet but the thing is is if they have a sloping front yard it can be able, you know you can add four feet to that really easily and then you've got like this much of the top of your ladder peeking over the top over the edge of the gutter that you have to climb up and down on you really want to have a good three feet over the top of the gutter for to be the safest thing, especially if the roof is a little bit steeper, maybe it's a six, seven, or eight. You're coming back down, you want to be able to grab onto the top of the ladder to, to, to get back onto the ladder so you can climb down. If it's four inches above the gutter and you're trying to like, you know, you're coming down to 712 and you're already a little bit nervous about it. I mean, this is how people end up in the hospital. So get a, as long of a ladder as you can, as, as reasonable, you can afford. They're not that expensive and that you can get into your vehicle or onto your vehicle. And again, that's why I, I, I run with a 24 foot extension ladder and a 32 foot extension ladder. Those are the two ladders. So if, if I go do claims, that's what I do. Um, and as I would say, um, don't rely on trying to use your phone to take photos. You can do it, but if you get deployed in Dallas or Phoenix in the summer or Atlanta for that matter, and you're climbing on roofs, your phone, my phone anyway, well, if it gets too hot, it'll shut off and it'll say, it'll just say it's, it's shut down because it's too hot, right? And if you're seeing it on somebody's roof and you're trying to take pictures and it just shuts off, then you're dead in the water. There's literally nothing else you can do. Um, so I would recommend getting, I, I, I've been using the Fujifilm XP 130, 140. You can get them at Costco for like 100, 120 bucks, 130 bucks, something like that. You put a little SD card in it, right? This kind of deal. And... Make sure you have a laptop that's got an SD card slot, and this is what I use. I mean, this is the fastest thing still. ExactWare is working on stuff that's going to kind of make this whole setup obsolete, but it's not going to have um, any effect on the temperature making your phones shut off unless they do something, unless Apple or Android does something about that, or you can figure out a way to cool off. This thing will work when it's 120 degrees outside. Um, get some Cougar Paws. I don't have any cougar paws in here, do I? I'm going to recommend getting at least a 35 foot. If you go online, you can find 40 footers. I like a 40 foot tape measure because, you know, if you have a, a house that's 38 feet long, they may say, sound like a simple thing to, you know, just run this out 30 to 35 foot. And then, you know, that's well, the other, it's, it's three feet. It's pretty simple. But if it's a 70 foot long house, I like just I like to be able to not have to like take more than one measurement, take two measurements for something that could take me one measurement. Five feet sounds doesn't sound like a whole lot, but in my experience, I like the forty footers. I would if they had a fifty foot like metal tape like this, I would buy it. But they don't have that. So a couple of weeks worth of clean t shirts, underwear, and socks. 
because you're gonna need to change that stuff every day so you don't stink. Um, and then we said cougar paws, khaki pants, durable, not like, you know, like a, like a stretchy polyester kind of stuff because you can that stuff can get scratched scratched up and torn pretty easily in the field if you're going through somebody's backyard and they've got bushes and you got a little narrow spot. Gets a little bit more durable, Carhartt kind of thing, you know, Duluth Trading Company. You don't have to get like the super thick stuff or whatever, but just something that's going to be, you're going to be outside if you're, if you're going to do field claims. Um, and so you're going to need something that's going to protect you from, you know, getting your, your, your nice pants getting scratched up. You're not going to be in an office, so you don't need to have like super cool, casual, Banana Republic, you know, whatever, H&M kind of stuff. Um, and if you're not wearing cougar paws, like if you're working, if you're not... You're not going to wear your cougar paws like just all day long. You're only going to wear them when you climb on a roof. Um, so you need to have some um, leather, like hiking shoes that look that would look nice in an office. No, no IA firm is ever going to approve of you wearing tennis shoes or anything that looks like a tennis shoe. Like these tennis shoe colors are white. Always go with like a muted brown or gray. You can get the trail running shoes, but as long as they're leather muted colors you'll be good to go. You're not going to get in trouble with those. Get yourself a good hat, sunscreen and things like that. Um, it's kind of, I mean, the basics of the gear, a good laptop, you want to make sure that it's, it's got enough horsepower that it can run, um, Xactimate according to Xactimate specifications or Sim Simbility or SimSol or whatever you might be using. Um, and a printer. And I like, uh, oh, I don't have it in here, but I like a, uh, a battery, powered like mobile printer like canon makes a good one and, and hp actually makes a really good one they're they're more expensive than the regular ones if you have a power inverter in your car you can get a regular 80 dollar printer and plug that in in your back seat and you, you'll be good to go but just remember they're they're almost they're kind of disposable you're going to spend more money on ink than you will almost on than you will on the printer itself um, trust me and little pro tip on that um when you buy a new printer, uh, buy ink for it right away because they'll give you ink with it, but it's, they're going to be like a quarter full or like a half full. And you'll, the very first thing you're going to do is you're going to print like a hundred sheets of paper, and you won't that that first little print cartridge isn't going to make it through all that. So I would definitely get a new print, take the old one out, maybe keep it as a backup. You know, when when your new full, like the big fat full one starts to run out, then you can drop in that extra one and then go get some more. But I would just get a whole bucket of them. I mean, you're going to, you're going to use a lot of printer, uh, printer cartridges. <clears throat> so that's kind of the, the short list of stuff. Um, so for gear for getting started, and if you go to adjustyourtv.com slash resources, there's a whole bunch of stuff on there. Um, and some software stuff, some services and all that kind of stuff. I, I think, and I try to keep that, that page updated. Um, and then we've got question number four. We know that there are certain states that get hit harder with storms and natural disasters. Are there specific states that typically need more adjusters to go to that you would recommend us getting reciprocal licenses in first? <clears throat> so my short answer to this is get your home state license. If you live in a state that does not license adjusters, and there's a bunch of them, right? there's like 12 or 15 of them, I think. <clears throat> um, Colorado's one of them, believe it or not. Illinois is a, is a state, unbelievably, that does not license adjusters. Indiana does. Um, pretty much every state from uh, Kansas to North Dakota, straight up, does not license adjusters. Minneapolis or Minnesota does. So you're going to be working... To get started, you know, if you're doing property claims, you're probably going to get started on Property Cat. So you're probably going to get called to an, a, a, a storm somewhere between the Front Range, Colorado, um, over to we'll say Ohio. You know, maybe the maybe the 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 border with West Virginia from east to west, and then from the Canadian border to the Mexican border. So that basically in that square. So my recommendation is. Get your home state license and then get uh, Texas, get Florida, and Florida is, is if, you, if, you, if your state does not license adjusters, then I would get your Florida license first as your DH, your designated home state license, which we call a DHS. And then the reciprocal with, they're all, the states that are reciprocal are pretty much reciprocal with every other state, except for like California, 
I think Arizona, New York, there's and the, Hawaii, I think is another one. There's there are a handful of states that aren't reciprocal with anybody. Um, <clears throat> you still want to like try to get work on getting those states as well. Um, so Texas, Florida, Oklahoma, Indiana, and Minnesota are the like the five states that I recommend getting after you get your home state license. If your home state license, and then from there, I mean, get as many as you can. So I would work on that box, work on the southeast because you get you know when hurricane season pops up. Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, uh, uh, Georgia, those states all get hit. Um, and then in the Northeast, you know, they're not going to have a whole lot of stuff in the summer. You know, occasionally they do get hit with hurricanes periodically, <clears throat> but they're going to have winter storms and things like that. Um, and then the Northwest, which you've got Seattle, Portland, Washington, Oregon, Northern California, um, even into Idaho, um, and even into Montana, you know, we can get um, high winds up here. We can get hail up here, especially the farther east you go into Montana, like eastern Montana. We get some monster hail. Billings can get smashed up pretty good. And then in the wintertime again, you know, they'll Washington, Oregon, down in like on the coastal areas have pretty mild winters, but occasionally they'll get a big blowout where they get three feet of snow. Or they'll get, you know, like up in Bend, like up in the mountains, they'll get some snow and stuff. And so you'll get a lot of catastrophe claims that way. So I'm, I'm, t you know, starting in that square, those first five licenses and then kind of fill in that box. Um, Southeast, Northeast, Northwest, Arizona gets a lot of hail, uh, especially Southern Arizona, California, you have to have two years of experience as an adjuster and don't before they'll even give you a license. Um, and there's, there's work in California. I mean, they get mudslides if they get heavy rains during a certain season, fires, um, I've worked in California several times with, without a license. Um, so, and in those cases, sometimes you're working under a temporary license. New York is a really, really good license to get. Um, all that being said, as far as licensing goes, I, I, I'm over the past like three years, I've kind of changed my tune on this a little bit. I, these days I'm recommending that you get every license. And the reason why is because, um, a lot of companies, a lot of carriers and, a lot of IA firms that are kind of operating as TPAs, they are going to a sort of a split model where you have people in the field taking photos and writing scopes, and then they, they upload that. And then somebody who's sitting in a desk or, you know, on their couch at home is taking those photos and that scope and they're writing it up. The person who's writing the claim has to have a license. So you could live in Kansas City and get a claim in New York or get a claim in California or get one in Hawaii or get one wherever, right? So you so you need to get every single possible license that you can because if you want to go run cl cat claims all summer long, you know, you want to be outside and you want to be like a field person and there's still r plenty of roles out there. I, I'm having this conversation with a lot of IA firms. I'm asking them this specific question. You know, what is, is our job going away? Is it going to look different in the next few years? And everybody's like, no. COVID changed a lot of things. Um, the, the experiments that some companies have been doing with the virtual assisting haven't quite worked the way they wanted them to. So there's still a, a, a plenty of opportunities for like a robust, experienced license adjuster, just so everybody knows. I'm, I'm not scared. I'll just put it that way. Anything can happen. I mean, we saw what's what happened in 2020, but I, I think that the doom and gloom is not as bad as it might seem. So... That being said, there's still there's there's more opportunities now for adjusters to work remotely, writing claims in Xactimate and then handling claims remotely, right? So, but in order to do that, you have to be licensed in all those other states because they're going to want to try and throw claims at you from every possible state, <clears throat> right? So, <laughs> long story short, on that one, get them all, but start with the Midwest. The Midwest is where you're going to see most of the like the hail, the summer hail is. There's always a hailstorm somewhere every summer. There's not always a hurricane. There's not always a wildfire. There's not always a winter storm. But there is always a hailstorm. In my career, twenty and since 1999, I had not seen a summer where there wasn't work in hail or high winds in the Midwest. Okay, and now we've got, uh, finally, startup costs, right? So you're going to need some gear. You're going to need some training. Um, I would say that you could probably get away with... Um, Without going diving all into these numbers and boring you guys with just kind of like you know number crunching because it would 
I'll have to sit here for, I like spreadsheets, so I'm, I would probably sit here and mess with it for a little bit. I'm not going to bore you guys with that. Um, I would try to, if you're already, if you're employed right now, you have work and you don't have savings, if you don't have any savings set or money set aside for this, then keep working. Don't quit your day job and try to save back, I'd say at the minimum, the absolute minimum, 5000 bucks. Shouldn't be that hard to do. Pick up extra work. You can actually pick up extra work as a photo and scope person. You can go to OnSource online. You can do auto through them. You can do property through them. You go to wegolook.com. You can do auto and property. Um, Crawford has the Crawford Inspection Services, which is ladder assist. So if you've got a ladder, you can get assignments on your phone and go meet an adjuster at a house and take his camera up there and take a bunch of pictures and write the diagram and then come back down and give it to him, leave and get paid, right? So there's like, this is another one of those opportunities, right? For field people. Um, you can do things without being licensed. And a lot of those are the photo and scope things where you just go to the house, all you just walk around the house, take photos, you know, a series of photos that are of the house, get pictures of the damage, and then, and then maybe write down a, a, a scope some of them don't even have you do a scope. They just want you to take pictures, send it up, and then get get paid, right? So you can drive for Uber or Lyft or Postmates or Uber Eats or whatever it is and deliver pizza and make extra money to save that money back. That's kind of beyond the scope of what we do here. But it's if, if, you're, if you really want it and you're willing to, to, to kind of make it a priority, then it's, it, it's not going to be as hard as you think to save back five grand. And that, and again, that's the minimum. I'm going to be more comfortable with twice that probably because you have to remember when you do finally get, you know, deployed on your first event that you have to pay for a hotel, right? You have to pay for fuel to get there. It, it may be a month before your first paycheck comes in. Even if you're closing claims right away, they may have a backup. They may say, oh, well, payroll got, you know, we got swamped. And sorry, everything's going to be two weeks later. That happens. I've seen that happen before. Um, then you're, you know, you're looking at a $3,000 hotel bill, right? So that just ate up almost all your five grand. Um, so, you know, for the training and everything, you can, sky's the limit on the cost of training. Um, you could go to veteran adjusting school, uh, which is a six week kind of immersive, like claims catastrophe deployment simulation where they teach you how to do everything. And when you graduate from that, if you, if you, if you graduate, you have to test obviously, um, you can write your own ticket. Every IA firm in the, in the country will will pick you up and put put you on their roster if you went through veteran adjusting school. It's twenty two thousand dollars. It's not cheap, um, and they take a limited number of students every year. Um, but there are plenty of other really good schools out there. I mean, there's Mile High. There's uh, TSI's got training. There's a bunch of training centers down in, in Texas. There's one in Bernie that I'm blanking on the name. Um, Lots and lots of training out there, but the key thing is that you need to get from any of the training that you go to, <clears throat> you need to have some fundamental skills in scoping and, and damage damage uh, evaluation and identification as well as material identification and evaluation. So you need to be able to look at a, a wall and say, okay, that's orange peel texture. It's not hand like a hand texture in the drywall, right? You have to know the difference in that. You got to know the difference between paint grade and a stain grade baseboard. You got to know the difference between a 25 year and a 30 year shingle, right? These are critical things that if you don't get them right, then you're going to write an inaccurate estimate. You're either going to underwrite it and get busted. You're getting trouble for underwriting, for underwriting claims guaranteed. Or if you overwrite it, you'll get your hand slapped. And if you keep overwriting because you're not, you're, you're, you're writing the wrong things in the estimate, then they will, you know, scoot you on out the door, right? So, um, you also need to have a really, really very, very solid foundation in Xactimate. This is this goes way beyond getting a level one, two, or three certification, which I think those are important. Those those will teach you all of the the nuts and bolts and where everything is in Xactimate, right? The the level one, two, and three. At level one, I mean, I don't think that that teaches you basically how to start it up and put your name in it, right? Level two is kind of like the the one that everybody mostly gets. Level three is the mastery level. I mean, you're going to be able to make a, a massive sketch with it. I think they're all valuable. The problem is, is that it, the the those certifications don't really they don't teach you a claims workflow. They don't teach you how to run a claim through Xactimate. They just teach you how to use the software. You have to know how to use the software. You don't necessarily have to get the certification. 
<clears throat> although having that credential does show to firms when you put it on your resume, level two certification, level three certification, that you have tested, demonstrated proficiency in the software, which is very, very important. Because if, if you go on a big cat like last summer and you don't have proficiency in the software, they're going to know instantly, right? The more critically, I would say, get that, get that training, get those, those certifications in Xactimate, and then practice. Because those certifications, if, if, you, if you got level three certified last July and you haven't worked yet, just as an example, and you don't get your first chance until August, like the, you know, we get another big hurricane in August this year, then it'll be 13 months since the last time you touched Xactimate. You're not going to remember any of that stuff. I don't care if you got a level 37 Xactimate certification. If you don't practice it, if you don't get in there and 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 go through a basic repetitive claims workflow process, this is the number one thing. I'm a, for everybody who's listening who's new, who's wanting to get started in this, of all the things that I've said in this whole however long I've been going here, this is the number one thing. You've got to practice an Xactimate and a basic, and don't you have to practice four hours a day? You know, I would say practice for a half an hour a day, right? So, and this is, this is how I would recommend that you do it. Pretend that you have a water spot on the ceiling in any room in the house, pick a room, right? I pick a base, like a bedroom first, because if you start dealing with cabinets and stuff, then it gets, it can get really complicated really quickly and pretend like that that's a whole claim, right? So let's work through the, the claims, the claims process, right? So you're going to go outside with your camera, and you can take take a risk photo, and I'm gonna I'm gonna scope the outside of the house. I'm gonna take pictures. No damage. No damage. No damage. No damage. Right, front, right, back, left, and then if you want to, if you got a ladder, you can jump up on your roof and do the same thing. Um, but for the purposes of this, keep it simple. Right. Let's not. We're not gonna try to do a total loss. Is there like a practice claim? Then you go inside the house to the room where you're gonna say pretend like there's a, a water spot on the ceiling. Say this. It's the size of a you know, a 33 RPM record, remember those things? And get pictures, I would say, go in all four corners of the room, take pictures into the room to get a full overview of the room, then get a wide shot showing where that, that water spot is in relation to other things, you know, if there's a door or a window that's on the wall there. Get those two things in the same shot, then get a close-up of the area where the damage is, and then write an estimate, right? So let's, we got paint, we got some insulation. Maybe there's popcorn texture on the ceiling. Maybe you've got acoustic ceiling tile. Maybe who knows what you've got in there, right? Write a, sh a th three, four, five line item estimate and then do it again the next day. Like that's it. If you do that, even if you do that three times a week, if you're like, all right, I'm going to take an hour and I'm going to pretend like I've got six shingles blown off the back slope and just get in there, find those line items, get used to it, get build some muscle memory in the software and that. More, I think more than really anything besides maybe like time management, which is a whole other thing, um, that's going to be, that's going to serve you the best when you, when you do finally get onto your first major cat deployment or you get assigned claims where you're the main person on the, the claim. You're not just walking around, just taking photos with your phone for a, through an app. Um, because you'll be able to say, all right, well, I know all this stuff is, I've seen this already, right? If you don't do that and if you just rely on, you know, your Xactimate level two certification that you took eight months ago. I mean, you're in a better shape than somebody who didn't take that at all, but you're going to, you've, there's so many other things to learn and to, and to kind of wrestle with and to like, it's corralling out. There's like 500 cats, right. That you have to like kind of herd and corral into an area and keep them all going the same direction. The Xactimate is, is a big, great big cat, but it's not the only one. So you have to make, if that one gets out of control, then you're pretty much lost. You have to keep all the rest of them going, right? So to answer all your questions, I, I wanted to get on here and just kind of do this in a video instead of trying to make like a 5,000 or a 25,000 word uh, post. Um, but if you guys have questions about this stuff, you can comment there. You can also send me an email um, to, if you go to adjustertv.com slash contact, that form goes straight into my email. So if you if you like if you just put your name, email address, your subject line or whatever, and then a short message saying, "Hey Matt, here's I have two questions," and then hit submit, it'll pop up in my email, like immediately, um, and then I'll I'll get to it when you know the next time I'm sitting down to do email, and I, and I I'll sit down and I'll I'll yap like this in emails. I try to keep it concise, but I, but I try to to give you guys as much information as I can. This is Adjuster TV.